Okay. So today I will talk to you about uh, code quality and how to try to assess it. Okay, uh, I didn't do all of this work by myself, so I want to thank various members of my team who have highly contributed to this effort. And also I want to thank, because uh, we did a lot of experimentation, uh, uh, Megware, Calmip, IT4I and, I, IT4I and IWS for providing us with machine time to perform experiments. So first I will start with a brief introduction with Macao because this will be the framework, the performance framework, which will be used throughout this talk. Okay, so essentially our objective as many performance tools, we're trying to characterize performance of HPC application. Our specific orientation is to be really application driven. And to some extent, we want to guide the user through the optimization game by trying to assess for each optimization, whether it will be beneficial. And in particular, we want to evaluate the amount of the benefit. So it's what we call the return on investment. You apply one optimization and we try to tell you where it will bring you 10% performance improvement. So we are supporting uh, x86, both Intel and AMD instruction set. Uh, on uh, ARM, we are uh, supporting Neoverse, V1, V2, and N1. Okay, one of the characteristics of uh, Macau is to be a, a set of various tools, okay, then that we can combine and we need to aggregate the different view. Uh, so everything is available and we give some website reference at the end. Something which is very important, our operating principle is to do everything at the binary level. So it allows to avoid to have uh, the compiler in the way. Okay, so typically I want just to show you, for example, to what we will see and I will so, show various displays of this uh, in this uh, flavor. So first we have some global metrics that we call essentially measurements, right, directly. So you can see the total time and so on, time spent in loops, analyzed loops, inner loops and so on, good. And then you have what we call potential speed up because as I was saying before, we try to take into account potential performance improvement due to some specific optimization. I will not go through everything, but we can look at perfect polarization, then various degrees of uh, vectorization. And the final thing, which is very important, we have this global view at the whole app level, but we're also capable of showing detailed performance analysis directly at the loop level. Okay, now, before I want to give a brief outline of my talk. So we'll start with a motivating example, how to identify some potential compiler issues. And then I will call it few examples, essentially two case studies. By the way, this project is still very flexible, right? So we have accumulated already some uh, know-how, some expertise in uh, analyzing compiler output, but I'm sure that everybody attending can provide us with some remarks which are valuable and that we should integrate into this project. Okay, so the motivating example, the target code is a very simple code. It's um, a mini app called HACC from Lawrence Livermore, right? And our target machine was uh, a 296 course provided by Megware. Uh, I think it's uh, Zen, uh, I think Zen 3 or Zen 4 machine, right? And we are testing, uh, uh, in fact, uh, free compilers, that's okay. Uh, we were testing uh, AMD, Clang version, GNU CC, and the Clang from Intel. We'll talk essentially AMD versus Clang because it's it was the most interesting comparison. For each compiler, we have been testing 16 flags. And in fact, uh, this methodology was carrying out in a project called QAS that we are doing uh, systematically with, uh, with Intel. Okay, we are developing some uh, systematic benchmarking, in particular trying to explore few compilers and a few compiler switches. Okay, so typically, for example, you see the list of uh, 16 compiler flags that we are testing. By the way, they have been grouped by pack of four. So the first one is uh, everything with a minus or three option. Okay, then uh, the minus O2 to see the impact of vectorization. And then the last two, uh, the last eight are essentially the first eight plus FLTO, right? And we have been trying also within each pack, you can see 512 vector length, 256 and so on. 
want to see the impact of vectorization. Okay, so we are looking now at uh, AOCC and you see the timing diagrams, right? You can see the 16 different variants. O3, all of the O3 is in green and all of the O2 variants are in blue. And uh, in, this in this histogram, lower is better and it's time, right? So you can see that essentially we are varying between what? 79 seconds all the way to 81 seconds. But they are really, I will say the compiler flags have almost uh, no impact, right? So you can see that the best is perhaps the version 12, the set 12 of uh, the compiler flag, but that's all. Okay, now when you look and uh, when you compare with ICX, and here you can see that we are using that Macau view, which is uh, we are capable of comparing side by side the output of two compilers, right? And I circled in red, which is important, the total time or profile time. You can see that there is almost a ratio of 10 between AOCC and ICX. And uh, we said, look, it's a very simple benchmark. How come it can be very such a big, a big gap between the two? We went a bit further and we saw this diagram, which is very interesting because in this diagram, we are listing the time spent into the various uh, code categories. You can see that in blue, this is the binary, right? And we see popping up, okay, for AOCC, that big green region, it's the time spent in math library. And you can see that on the Intel ICX, there is no time spent in my library. So we said, hey, what is the big problem? The big problem is perhaps that math library. So we looked at it and we said, ah, let's look at what is the library used. In fact, we saw that uh, AOCC by default, instead of using their own library, libALM, they use the libM, which is installed. And we say, ah, that's the problem. We installed ALM, right? And uh, we forced the use of libALM. Unfortunately, no performance gain. Okay, now we think twice and we said, the big issue is that ICX didn't show any time in the math library. So there is something we should try to suppress the math library usage, right? And uh, we are thinking and we say, what can happen? Well, we force fast math and uh, we saw that uh, it will force inlining and it will be suppressing lib calls. And then, okay, the performance of AOCC and uh, uh, ICX was very similar within three uh, percent. Okay, the difficulty is that, by the way, ICX didn't explicitly say that fast math was used. In fact, don't forget that fast math, to some extent, is a dangerous option because it changes the numerical property of the numerical behavior of the code. So it should be only used with some uh, some care, or at least the user should be aware of it. There, it was interesting to see that ICX didn't bother informing Rome. They went through, it generated good numbers, but still, uh, it's why we were a bit uh, surprised at the behavior. Okay, so what are the main lessons from this uh, example? Something that you all know, hey, yes, you should try multiple compiler options. Well, the second lesson, which is less obvious, is we discovered the issue on AOCC only because we are trying ICX. So the second lesson, which is very important and not so easy to carry out, we should try multiple compilers. Even if your favorite compiler for some reason is, for example, AOCC, it's always worth trying out uh, ICX to see whether there is not something good to take from ICX. And um, the real lesson also is uh, we need to make sure that we are capable of analyzing and detect compiler failures. Right there, for example, you could say that AOCC was not able to link or to inline correctly the library. Well, for using uh, lesson three, if you want to go further than simply stating that there is some performance difference, you need tools. And that will be the, the main topic of all of this talk. So why we should analyze compiler output? Clearly we could say, yeah, that's evaluating code quality. But what are what is it for, really? The first target of such analysis is code developer. Essentially, we could say, well, it's improving application performance. And also, to some extent, because it's something that people have to face now more and more often, 
when you develop an application, you need to port it for sure across several generations of machines. And perhaps a few of them will be x86, but a few of them might be ARM, and you should be able to port across. So first thing that we, and I listed there some specific goals, but which are very important. So we can uh, analyze the impact of compiler version, okay? And the answer should be, oh no, I don't want to use the latest version of uh, Intel compiler, it's quite bad. We should go further between, before, uh, beyond a simple go, no go decision. We need to understand why. And we could say, ah, it's simply because they messed up on some optimization. And there, it's interesting to capture what is the drawback on the new compiler generation. Well, after you, you can say, hey, let's look at compiler switches and try to identify the best compiler switches. You could say, we can try them all, except it can be very expensive. So it's much better for us perhaps to analyze the behavior of a few compiler switches and to see the drawback, right? What is the problem? Okay, and from that, you could say, I can correct instead of doing a brute force search without having any idea where you are going to. Then you could analyze the differences in compiler behavior. And the big thing is across different compilers. Well, the typical stuff should be to say, yeah, I want to select the best compiler, but you could say, no, I want to stick to my classical compiler, but I want to import some good ideas some good optimization which were performed by another compiler. And I give here an example where you could say, compiler has been able to vectorize, my compiler has not been able to, okay, let me check. And then I can try to import the idea for inserting a simple SAMD flag. And uh, then also if you are an ISD or library developer, you want to make sure that your library or your ISD code is uh, performing well across multiple compilers, right? And you can check here the performance portability and what are the, the limitations of some of the compilers. Second reason, okay, target, it's not code developer, that's a, a, a typo. It's uh, essentially the compiler developer. Okay, so we could say the first two goals are very similar to the, the previous one was I, I was listing, okay, but then the third one is interesting when you're analyzing the compiler behavior, you want to perform a, what I would call a competitive positioning. You are a compiler developer at Intel, you know how well you are doing with respect to AOCC and so on. ARM also, the com ARM compiler developers, they want to know how far behind or ahead they are from their uh, other compilers uh, on x86 and so on. And again, I want to facilitate migration and application port, because I consider that this will be a, a very important challenge for the next decade, is being able to move quickly and swiftly from one compiler, one software environment to the other one. And the last target is uh, also some uh, system, system sales, right? They could do benchmarks before sales, very important to detect quickly what are the compiler issues, but also after sales, right? You can help the, app, the application developer and the user to fully exploit the system capabilities. Again, this is very similar to the app developer, but don't forget that once you are a system provider, you have less knowledge on the application side, but much more on the software stack. And it's interesting that same goal, but with different weapons. Now, how to assess code quality? You could say simple. I measure the time and uh, it's... Uh, the classical uh, English expression, the proof is eating the cake. If the cake is good, that's uh, good. However, we have to be a bit careful because it's, you should not only compare at the whole application. You need to go a bit down, look at the function level and the loop level. Why? Well, because if you stay at the appli whole application level, you could say, well, the two compilers are almost equivalent. Then when you go down at function, you can see that Compiler A is winning on some functions, while he's losing on some other ones. There can be some compensation. So you need to perform a more detailed analysis at the function and at the group level. Uh, what is the limitation of a timing analysis, which is the easiest to carry? You need to run on the same machine. Otherwise, if you are running on an x86 and uh, a Graviton-free, 
okay, it's not the same hardware. You need to factor in the hardware differences. Nightmare. Uh, so the second thing, which is a bit more vicious, uh, we are going to perform the timings at the binary level. And to some extent, all of our timing info is related to the binary code fragment, not to the source code. So you need at some point when you want to compare, okay, don't forget that you will have two different binaries with two different compilers, right? And you will need to have to match the function names, which is fairly easy. At the loop level, it might be a bit more complex because very often the same loop can have three or four binaries associated with it. If you have vectorization, you have the main loop, pin loop, tail loop, you can have three or four different binaries and you need to group them together, okay, and to compare them. Uh, don't forget, you could say, well, they are stupid. They should not perform at the binary level. They should do it at the source level, except every timing done at the source level in general require probe insertion and uh, therefore it will distort potentially code behavior. Uh, just a small and a quick uh, remark there for both functions and loops. The main idea is very similar. How do we do the matching? Okay. Uh, first thing we use is the connection between ASM and source code. If you rely on the compiler minus G option, it allows to establish the direct link between the binary and the source code. Okay, good. And then how do you do? You group all our versions together because they will point to the same code region. Now you have to be a bit careful because sometimes you will have a binary which will point to a code section line 72 to 81 then you will have another binary which will point to 71 to 82. And it's really likely that the two are finally pointing to the same code region. So you need to to a bit flexible there to have some approximation in source line numbers, right? So that's one difficulty because if you have very small loops, you can, you can be in trouble there. For matching functions, this, the idea is exactly the same except it will be much simpler because in general, there are not so many versions at the function level. What is the main limitation of timing analysis? I don't know if you know, but I'm French. So proof is eating the cake is not sufficient because you know that that cake is good, but what you are interested in, right? In reproducibility. So if you want reproducibility, you need to have some more info about the cook or the recipe. And you need to understand Okay, in more practical terms, why there is a timing difference. You could say, ah, don't do simple timing analysis. Look at stores, cash level access rate, and so on. It will provide additional interesting info, but you will get really the same problem. You could say, better idea. Let's look at the compiler optimization report. It will tell me everything, right? And it gives really some info about the code generation process. In general, it's good for providing you success. It will not tell you many information on failures, shortcomings. In general, they will hide them. Uh, the real problem is that they are strongly proprietary and in particularly with all of the good proprietary compilers. And the final point, I am not able to compare them because GCC has its own format, ICX has another one, and AOCC, a third one, and Clang and Flang, and everybody has their own format, so not possible to compare. So what we should do, we should develop our uh, own methodology. So what are the key ingredients of our methodology? We'll focus essentially on loops. We'll not focus on the other. We will hope that most of the time is spent in innermost, in between, or outermost loops. We'll focus on assembly code, because that's the main compiler output. And we'll use ASM, uh, we'll evaluate the quality, the quality through, and I will come back trying to detect a few characteristics and we'll use for, for that the, our code quality analysis analyzer, which is built in Macau. For example, we'll look at the port functionality usage, we'll look at vectorization, instruction set use, and so on, and data access. I will give a few more detailed examples. Also, something which is very important, we are capable of taking values as ASM fragments, and we want to compare them. So to compare them, you cannot really very often execute an extracted assembly code. So we'll have some very simplified simulator, which allows us to compare ASM version. Now, by the way, something which is a bit drawback of our method is we catch 
compiler mistakes, but also source code issues will be taken into account. They will be agglomerated. That's a bit of a problem. Then we'll perform two-level analysis. We'll do many things at the static, okay? In the SQL, we'll denote it uh, SA. And then we'll perform a few dynamic measurements, okay? So that will be the, the important thing. Dynamic will use, for example, to assess the relatively cost of uh, the pin loop, tail loop versus the main loop. And that's very important when you want to compare. Okay, so all of the performance issues that we are going on, code quality issues, we'll classify them into five main categories. Loop computation, it's essentially related to the loop computations by itself. Okay, really the, part, the computing part. Control flow will be whether there are calls, there are if statements and so on, good. Data access, essentially the array access, stride, right? Everything which is basically related to memory operations. Vectorization roadblocks, it will be anything which we think has prevented vectorization to, be, to take place. And then it can happen that the code is vectorized, but finally that the vectorization is not efficient for various reasons. It can happen that uh, we have a, a 512 bits uh, instruction width, and finally that the compiler for some funny reason decided to limit its use to 256 bits. And we could say it might not be the top. You are just using half of the potential peak performance of a machine, and we can report that. So let me see at various things that we are looking in details. Okay, loop computations. We detect the presence of reductions, the expensive floating point instructions. And this is typically an example where you could say it's not a, a problem with a compiler, it's the source code, it's the algorithm itself. The fact that there are many divide and square roots could be a, a problem. Although it might happen, yes, there are divide and square roots, but some compilers are more clever than the other ones because they are capable to hoist some of them. So we will be able to detect that. So then there will be detecting also convert instructions, some low level details, but which are quite interesting. The fact that whether we are using fuse multiply add or not, uh, for example, eh, we have a very large loop body in terms of bytes. Very likely it will exceed the micro op cache size. So it means that here, for example, a good recommendation will be to perform loop splitting and so on. You can see uh, various um, drawbacks that we are detecting. Okay, highly variable, for example, iteration uh, across loop instances, the same loop is executed millions of times and from one instance to the next one, performance is highly variable. So it might, uh, it might be revealing a, a, a deep problem. Also something which is very important, low iteration count. Typically, if you have three, four iteration count, it's a bad sign and it's something is going wrong. Okay, uh, control flow, as I said, prevents of call. We distinguish uh, between two and four paths and more than four paths. More than four paths, we consider that the control flow will be a killer. The fact that it's a non-enormous loop will be also something which is going to cost because essentially many of the optimization will not be performed. Low iteration count is also important. Uh, again, vectorization roadblocks, you can see that the same issue can pop up into several categories, right? Presence of calls, it's a problem uh, for uh, the control flow, but it's also a roadblock of, um, at, the, at the vectorization level. By the way, it shows if you can still see calls at the assembly level, it's, it also shows that, for example, the compiler has not been able to inline. So that's uh, a drawback. And you can see that, for example, non-unit stride access, which are not capable of being vectorized except on some ARM machine, but on, for example, x86, you don't have support, so that's important. Okay, and vectorization uh, uh, issue, you can have uh, some vectorization, but not 100% vectorization. So partial uh, vectorization are worth detecting, some specific instruction, which we know are very costly, scatter and gather instructions are in particular very co costly. I mentioned that earlier, using 256 bits instead of 512 bits, right? So you are not using the, the full vector width. And mass instructions, although we could say these are vector instructions, when you use a mass instructions, you are almost certain that except in some 
very specific cases, you are leaving at least half of the performance of a machine on the table. Let's look at a few case studies. I will start with something completely very simple. I will say not completely stupid because it's a very important code. It's a matrix time a vector, case sparse matrix time a vector, and the matrix is stored in a compressed storage row. And uh, this test code was developed and provided to us by RW3H Aaron. And really, it's an essential kernel for many iterative methods. And it is tested with a non regular sparse matrix. If you look at this code, you could say, boof, easy, right? If you look at the I loop that I am uh, uh, highlighting, easy because it's a parallel loop. So we can run it in parallel. Good. Uh, what do you have after? You have also, in general, a very large iteration count on I, which is uh, typically several, several millions. That's, that's quite good. Then when you look at the innermost loop, the situation is a bit different because you have first, uh, it's a reduction. Look at the plus equal sign, it's a reduction. Okay, uh, something, uh, also you have an indirect access and something that you don't necessarily know, but in a sparse matrix time of vector, very often the number of non-zero elements per row is quite small, less than 15. So it means that this, uh, loop typically it has less than 15 uh, operations, so which is 15 iterations, so which is a killer a bit. So we have been testing that on uh, on uh, Skylake, two times 26 cores, 2.1 gigahertz, the open MP pile, and we are running on 52 threads. Really, nothing spec, nothing special, but we are using the full parallelism, and we are comparing GCC and ICX. And uh, we're expecting that ICX was going to go faster than GCC. Well, not true. So you can see that here are the timing, the total time, right? You can see that it's, uh, let's say, 37 seconds for GCC, right? We are both using uh, all three on both codes. And uh, uh, ICX is 42 seconds. So you could say it's just five seconds difference. But when you combine everything together, it's more than 10% on a simple kernel. What's happening? We looked at it. So we looked at the innermost loop. We are capable of analyzing that, right? And uh, we can see what? On the GCC front, the loop has not been vectorized. The loop, it remains, you can see that vectorization is zero and vector length is 12.5 because we are using on a, on a 512 bits. You are using one eighth and it's double precision. Okay, good. When you look, uh, ah, uh, ICX was much better. It was capable of vectorizing. So you can see that here, there is the main loop, 21 seconds, something. And uh, then there is a tail loop, which is a 6.7. So how you can detect that, you look at the vectorization ratio, 100% and 0%. And uh, when you look, you can see both of them are in direct access. One of them has low iteration count, but you have still this indirect access. Okay, so GCC remains scalar. Okay, ICX vectorized, but if you look at the timing, you could say 27 seconds on, um, on GCC versus roughly speaking, the same thing, 27, 28 seconds for uh, ICX. Doesn't explain the gap that we are seeing of five seconds. So what's happening? And there it's interesting because you need to go a bit further. Okay, let's look to see if we have not missed anything. So we could look at the open MP time. Okay, so we could say, ah, one is using GOMP, the other one is using uh, Intel Open MP. There might be a difference. Well, you can see that the names are different, which is really a pain <laughs> to match them, but you can see that here you have uh, uh, the GOMP stuff, and then we have uh, here the KMP flag, which is the Intel one. But roughly speaking, they are around 5.5 seconds, okay? So the open libraries, it's not the issue. So what is the issue? So if you look at GCC, we can see that, uh, yes, there is that famous vector loop. We detected the indirect access. Then you have an over loop, but which is just 3% of the time. And here we list you all of the details together with some penalty score. I will not enter in detail on that front, but we, 
we are also trying to assess the difficulty of removing some of these issues. Okay, indirect access, for example, we consider that it's not, uh, it's not easy, right? Now let's look at what's happening with ICX. Okay, we find the main loop vectorization, 100%. Again, the presence of indirect access. Ah, you see additionally the gather, the gather and scatter, which are costly. And again, it's inefficient vectorization. Now, if you look at the other loops, you can see that we have two other loops, 18% and 16%. Instead of going to the loop 14, we are going to jump directly on this one, and you will see one. This one is a peel and tail loop. We are capable of detecting that. And again, when you go back to our analysis, what we are performing at the level of the innermost loop, easy, right? So we know that that's a peel and tail loop. Okay, you have again indirect access, but that's okay. Now what happens with that loop, finally, which is the loop 14? 16 was the main loop, 15 is the tail loop. Hey, what's left? 14, that's the guilty guy with 18%. What's happening really? It's a disaster. What happens, and you need to think there, you have some special instructions, which is management there. You have several paths. You have exactly a very complex control flow, four paths. And if you think twice, what is the difficulty? It's dealing with a reduction. Okay, the instruction set of, um, of X86, there is no instruction for summing up all of the elements within a vector register. So we have to perform some specific instructions, and you can see that this the presence of a special instruction. So to some extent, which is very interesting, is that the fact that the Intel compiler was more clever, it vectorizes, combined with the fact that the iteration count was very low, it forced them using something which is bad, the reduction on a low iteration count, which is extremely bad for the ICX compiler, and it lost 10%. Okay, so there, the solution is quite simple. You tell the Intel compiler, don't use, don't vectorize, please remain scalar, it will be better. We can look at uh, also summarize everything which was happening. We, we had here a few loops, and then we are going to sum up here for R1, which is GCC, and uh, R2, which is for ICX. We want to sum up all of the issues that we have been encountering, right? And you can match, you can see that uh, Hey, what are the main differences between the code generated? So here are the real difficulties, the presence of more than five paths, five, no, more than four paths was a real killer. And it's really a drawback for the ICX. You can see that's really the point. non innermost loop, same number and so on. Low iteration count, that was also a big issue there. And you can see really by looking at the difference, what's happening and what, where are the things. By the way, by going back to the low level loop analysis, you can also figure out what's happening. Then we can try also to summarize further by aggregating across uh, several uh, compilers. And there it's an aggregated view. And to some extent, what you're interesting to see is, hey, what are the most important issues? Number of times they pop up. 15 control flow issues, vectorization roadblock 21. These are really the important thing, right? So that you should be concerned with and also the data access issue. It's interesting to see that it's combined and then we have a percentage, weighted count, what is it? It's essentially taking into account the relative time spent in every loop, okay? And combining them instead of having the percentage which is flat, assuming that every loop has the same weight. Case study two, we are going with open radios, which is a full app, right? Alors, why open radios? It's the open source version of the Altair, of the Altair well-known radios code, right? This very well-known uh, car crash code, okay? And we used open radios as a test for our methodology, okay? Again, we use the same configuration as before, Skylake, two times 26 cores, except there, we didn't use 52 threads, we used MPI 26 process, each process with two threads. That's really uh, what we found out by experimentation was the most efficient. Now let's look, and we are compa comparing IFX versus IFORT. 
And we can see, interestingly enough, there is 10% difference, right? So you could say, hey, where is it coming from, right? Okay, again, we do the same thing. We look at MPI plus OpenMP. Yes, there is a difference. You can see that, uh, okay, uh, KMP flag, uh, IFX is more performance, seven seconds. Okay, the MPI difference is 2.7 seconds, right? You look there. Total, it's 10 seconds, but it doesn't account for the gap between the whole application, which is 35 seconds. So you need to look again at all of the loops. And for example, I take here an example, which is kind of interesting. There is a loop. Both of them have been vectorized. When you look at the total amount of time, yeah, they are a bit different, right? You have uh, one in which you are spending around 10 seconds. The other one is a bit faster, not much, right? Three or four person, but still it's a difference. And when you look, you can see that they had a different strategy in code generation. This one, they got rid of a non-unit stride data access, while the other one, which was a bit uh, faster, they kept it, right? And uh, you can see that there were some different choices made by the compiler, and they made a difference. Again, I want to look at everything, so I am aggregating over 10 loops, could have aggregated over 30 loops, and so on, and we are going to generate similar statistics. And you can see that there, there are not so many differences, except that the code here is not as good, more scalar integer instructions on the front for, uh, uh, for I fort, right? You can see that again, I fort, it was suffering for, from a control flow issue. It had four paths there, four path there, so that's really a bad thing, um, which is interesting also. Oh yeah, that issue is very important. You can see that less than 10%, there was no FMA almost used in that code. And there is a reason, and both compilers, because open radios for numerical stability reason, they prevent the use of FMA. And the compiler didn't generate an FMA. And on our front, we decided hey, it's a bit of pity that no FMA is used. And therefore, we reported it as an issue, although it was a deliberate choice by, uh, by open radios. OK, again, the global analysis. I will not go further, but again, we are capable of aggregating. Now, let's jump to the wrap up and conclusion to stay on time. So. Yeah, trivial thing, but it's important to remind people of that stuff. Code quality generated by the compiler is really primary importance, okay? And there you can lose a lot of performance on the table. You could say, I don't care. I look only at parallelism. Yes, but if you lose 10%, okay, on all of, uh, the, of the performance on every core, it's your whole machine that you are that is handicapped by 10%. So you should be a bit more clever. The problem is that there is no magic rule. You need to check what compiler and what are the good compiler options. And you could say, well, I'm good. I have a systematic way of looking at all of the compiler options, except it can be extremely expensive, especially if you do brute force search. It's much better to say, ah, I see what are the current problems of a compiler, and let me try to push him in the right direction by using the right flags of the right directives at the loop level, okay? So the conclusion of his first slide is we need to perform systematic exploration of compiler flags. It's mandatory, but it's not enough. We need to go further. So we need to perform a detailed assessment of code quality. And uh, we are claiming that CQA Macau One View provides an efficient way of accessing uh, code quality. We are capable of identifying some compiler shortcomings and failures. And by the way, I'm sure uh, you have more failures to report and we could incorporate them and see how we can detect them. So there can be a long list of problems. That's not the difficulty. And we are capable of comparing between options and compiler. And we believe that these tools and methodology will be very useful for helping code developers finding the right compiler directives. That's one thing. Okay, and second, uh, to help compiler developer improving fixing their software in particular by allowing them to see what the other compilers are doing, right? I am done. Okay, here is a few uh, 
website. I want to jump only on this one, uh, if I can. I think I need to... Ah. Yes, I want to jump on that one because it's interesting. Okay, so if I was jumping to the web link that I was mentioning, and you can see that here you have plenty of tests with plenty of results that we have. Okay, you have a compare that I was showing. Uh, well, I don't know if I have the good ones. Um, okay, I can jump on this one. There you can see that uh, the count and so on. Everything that I was showing is available, and you have mu much more than that. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my slides and to let you ask questions. Okay, but uh, through that link, you can access all of the results that I was uh, uh, showing. Good, feel free to ask questions. How many do I have in the chat? Yeah, thank you, uh, William, for this uh, very interesting talk and giving us all the insight on how to use Macau uh, efficiently for com code analysis. Uh, so far, we don't have uh, any question. A question in the test. So I, either you explain it very thoroughly, or um, people still have to think about a good uh, question. <laughs> um, if you just want to uh, ask your question aloud, uh, just uh, like open up your mic and and uh, do do so. Okay, so while people are thinking, perhaps let me ask a, a simple question. Um, I, I found the talk very interesting and, and it gave me a lot of um, uh, uh, like details, like the tools provide a lot of details and so on. But I have a feeling that I, I still need to know a lot about code generation, the the assembler and so on. So as a normal developer who had, doesn't have like too much like low level experience, is there some whatever uh, wizard or something which helps them pointing them in the right direction? Or is there some document saying uh, like, so this is the, yeah, like the one, two, three uh, easy way to get at least like the simple things um, or yeah, like how yeah, does like how does a like a non so not so expert user uh, uh, get know. into for that? every problem that we are listing, we also provide a simple remedy that we consider that which could be working. If you have a non-unit stride access, we say, hey, look at restructuring your array. Right? If we detect, if you look at most of the problem, they point back to the source code. Right? So I don't tell you the, all of the ugly details of assembly. I try to format them. Let me check if I can go back. But um, most of them, I hope, are formulated in a way that, uh, yes, presence of cores, right? Uh, presence of two and four paths, right? Yes, it's done at the analysis level, but it's point back. Okay, to uh, some uh, difficulties or some issues at the source code. Non unit stride access, essentially, you should be able to detect that it's a problem. Not that uh, it's translated at the assembly level, but you have a pointer back to the source code, right? Indirect access also. The fact that it's a non innermost loop. The difficulty here, for example, the non innermost loop, it's uh, Something that uh, if you spend too much time in a non innermost loop, that's part of a of a problem. Okay, but I agree with you that we try to limit the amount of knowledge of assembly uh, level knowledge which is needed to understand our diagnostic. But we should go a bit further. I think I have another case. For example, reductions is essentially of expensive experience reductions. Everything like that, they are back to the source code and the user should be able to, to see the issue. Then there is something which is more vicious. I agree with you. Bottleneck in the front end, whoops, should not have done that. But bottleneck in the front end, uh, what happens? It relates to a strange mix, 
in the instruction generated, right? Or large loop body. At each time, we detect a problem and we try to provide a recommendation for the user at the source code level so they can work around about the issue detected. For example, the loop body is much too large, will not fit in the micro op cache size. Please split the loop in smaller loops. Yeah, I think, thank you. And, and yeah. yeah, it's, but I agree with you I, that it's one usual. of the difficulties. It, it... Yeah, it's, it's usual. Like uh, if you really want to uh, use a tool effectively, at some point there is no way around it in, in kind of learn how to use the tool, read the instructions, potentially uh, attend a, a, a training or something. And uh, yeah, like I guess no one can expect to uh, yeah download that tool, click on one button and get like a lot of stuff out of it automatically. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, not any more questions on? Not any more questions. Uh, then thank you everyone for, for joining. I hope it was uh, of some interest uh, to everyone. And as I said, um, the recordings and the slides will be avail uh, available soon. And yeah, uh, thank you very much. And yeah, have a nice day.